Well, hello, everybody, and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This time, I'm really psyched to have one of my colleagues from Red Hat, CMF, um, who's up in Stockholm with us to talk about modern architectures, um, going beyond just microservices, and doing some full stack demos. And by full stack, we really mean full stack. We're going to try and get him to show off using a lot of the middleware and other pieces that really do the heavy lifting for some of these applications that um, folks are building. And um, we're gonna have Q&A in the chat and Q&A after uh, his presentation. So he, he can't see the chat, so I may have to interrupt him once in a while um, and ask a question if it's really a, a somebody stumped. But um, otherwise we'll save most of the questions for um, after he's finished with the presentation. So without any more preface, I will let uh, CNF uh, introduce himself and take it away and we'll look forward to this journey. Thank you, Diane, and hello, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to talk about modern architecture beyond microservices today. I'm going to show you a, a, a demo, a full stack demo uh, of uh, essentially uh, what is beyond microservices. So microservices, everybody by now knows what it is, but in order to build services uh, in an enterprise environment with this architecture and take them in production, what other layers of stack are required? What else do we need to do to be able to take these things into production? But before that, let me uh, introduce myself with a few sentences about me. Uh, I'm a CMX at Akianfar. I uh, do technical product marketing for um, OpenShift at Red Hat. OpenShift is the Red Hat's uh, container platform. And you can reach out to me on email or Twitter uh, after this session, of course, uh, with any questions you might have uh, in future. But uh, let's get it started immediately. Uh, I'm going to uh, turn off my video after a little while so that it doesn't block any part of the slide or things that I'm uh, showing to you. Uh, so microservices, uh, a lot of people have been talking about microservices for the last uh, two years. Uh, it has taken over the whole blogosphere and half of the session at any developer conference you see is about microservices. There are good reasons for that. I have listed a few of the reasons people are so uh, interested in microservices for the use cases, of course, that it makes sense. It's not a bullet, silver bullet for everything, but it, it generally for complex application, it helps the fast, uh, faster time to market and uh, to be able to more be more efficient and scale easier. Uh, for the reason that you can break down their services to smaller ones, then you can develop them independently, deploy them independently, scale them independently. That simplifies things and also makes the management a lot uh, simpler. If uh, an application is uh, built of 1,000 classes and uh, hundred of them have, hundreds of them have changed, you want to make a deployment of that, it's a lot more complex than a, an, an application or service that is 10, 20 classes and two of them have changed. So the risks are... Uh, a lot, a lot lower, and that that's uh, like among the benefits that we see around microservices. And a lot of people uh, are trying or thrive to build application using this uh, architecture when it makes sense. Application that I'm gonna use in this demo is called Cool Store application. It's a uh, it's an online shop for uh, selling uh, products, uh, selling cool products from uh, Red Hat, like the Red Hat Polo Shirt or Red Hat Fedora. Uh, it is a web web based app and polyglot used uh, uses different type of technologies for building various services and it uses the microservices architecture some of the services are based on node some java using different type of frameworks and uh, they are all deployed as uh, as containers um, if uh, I'll set video off I switched to the application to show you. So this is the web application I'm talking about. We have uh, some really, really nice product on that. And uh, you see the inventory for each of these products. And uh, you see the, you can add them to your uh, shopping cart. Uh, these fedoras are actually really popular. I add a couple of more of them for my friends. You can go to the shopping cart, see what is added. Uh, I changed my mind about a sticker. I don't want that anymore. I just want the fedoras. And I can just make a purchase and go on. It's like a web shop as you would expect it. Uh, and the architecture of this application is built from each of these pieces being a microservice on their own deployed independently. So we have the web UI, uh, which is the front end that we were just browsing based on Node.js and AngularJS. Uh, and then we have three backend services. One is inventory service, a microservice that uses Java EE and runs on JWC AP backed by Postgres database. Um, and that one provides the uh, stock status, the blue 
uh, number that you see how many is left is coming from that inventory service. Then we have the catalog service that gives the list of products. Uh, that's a microservice that uses uh, JAX RS, uh, creates a REST service and runs on Tomcat. And we have the cart service that is uh, uh, also a REST service running on uh, JBoss AAP. Uh, the front end of our application does not talk to these services directly. Uh, we are using Agile integration and the uh, component based on uh, Apache Camel uh, and Spring Boot that is aggregating this API. So the, the gateway, cool store gateway, uh, that Spring Boot service uh, makes a call to all these backend services, uh, get the data, cleans it, transform to the JSON format that we want to consume in our web UI, uh, add or remove the information that it needs, and uh, sends JSON data to our uh, web front to be to be visualized uh, which builds that that whole service so we see that the inventory part uh, is one market service on its own those lists of products come from another service and the shopping cart functionality is also a service uh, on its own uh, and these services are all deployed uh, as containers uh, independently on OpenShift. And what is OpenShift? i keep mentioning it i haven't explained really what, what it is um, OpenShift is uh, Kubernetes for the enterprise. So it is a, a container platform based on Docker containers and Kubernetes orchestrator and all the other pieces that you require to be able to build containers and uh, run and manage them in production at scale. So it provides a self-service. Uh, it's a polygon platform. You can deploy different types of languages on it. Uh, we will look at JBoss middleware, Spring, and Node.js uh, in this example. Uh, and you can automate a lot of things around it. And the most important of all, it is it is a secure platform for running containers. Security is is one of the big issues around containers to make sure that if your container is not secure, it shouldn't be able to run on the platform. So platform makes sure that uh, unqualified or non-compliant containers cannot be just deployed. Uh, if you look at our application, so each of these services are packaged in a container and deployed on OpenShift, uh, and they expose a REST API that uh, other services are called in, are calling them, like the Cool Store Gateway service, or uh, it's a web front calling the REST API uh, to collect the uh, data and visualize it. And these services might be uh, Node.js, Spring Boot, Python, Jetty, Spring Boot, Tropis, or whatever uh, that is really. It's, it could be a combination of that uh, and that services. The platform works with those containers regardless of what they are. Uh, it's actually it only supports uh, also supports uh, .NET Core. Uh, 1.1 uh, since Microsoft has open source that and runs on Linux, so you could even run uh, .NET applications uh, on the platform. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, OpenShift and how these containers are deployed, or this application is deployed on the platform. Uh, I have a number of projects that we're going to go through. Uh, what I want to show right now is the production environment of this application. Uh, we have uh, a series of service groups. Uh, each service group is one or number of containers that I have grouped together uh, so to be able to easily understand and see them. So I have the web UI running as its own container, and then I have the gateway, the catalog service, cart, and, and the rest of services as you, you see. I get some monitoring information, metrics, how much uh, memory, uh, CPU, and network is being consumed for this specific container, and also how many containers are backing this service. So we have built-in load balancing for each of these services. Right now, I have one container running for my web front. Uh, if I click on that, I get a list of containers for that web front. It's one right now, click on that. Uh, I get the details of that container right now. So there's some really valuable information. Um, for example, what IP this container uh, is assigned to it and on which node is actually running. All these containers are running on a bunch of virtual machines. Um, and uh, I can see on exactly which virtual machine this, this specific container is scheduled. On the right side, I see some good information about uh, which image was used um, for deploying this container, uh, how much memory and CPU is assigned to it. And uh, of course, we can, uh, we can do bearish mode with this container. So you, you can consume more CPU than you're allocated if there is enough uh, capacity, for example, um, and uh, what's the current state it is running. Then we have the metrics tab. I get uh, like monitoring information about my container uh, so I can identify anomalies over time. I'll see right now there is one gigabyte of memory allocated to this container, but only about uh, like uh, 70, uh, 60, 68 memory, 68 megabyte is consumed. Uh, the same goes for the CPU and network. So uh, it, it 
helps me to debug this container is suddenly I have a Spark somewhere, but it also helps me to size the, the resource allocation a little better, right? As you can see, uh, I have too much memory assigned to this container, right? If this consumes only about 100 megabyte, I can probably reduce uh, uh, that one gigabyte to some, some number that is lower without affecting the, the performance of this container. The same goes for the CPU. So this metrics, the container specific metrics, it helps me a lot for uh, better utilization uh, of resources for the container, also debugging things. Uh, the logs tab, it helps me to look at the, the logs of the application. You see this uh, Node.js application running, the Node uh, server.js uh, command. Uh, it's really helpful for debugging and see what's going on in the container. Uh, and uh, we actually, in OpenShift, you have a central uh, log management solution also built in based on Elastic and Kibana. So even if this container is removed, the log is going to be pushed into Elastic and will be available for later analysis. Uh, terminal is also a really handy tool. So within the web console or through the command line uh, command, the command line environment, I can directly have a remote shell access inside the container without having an extra tool. So right now, I'm actually inside that uh, Node.js container. If I run a ps or ex command to see what, which processes are running, I see that well, there is a Node server JS. Uh, I could like do some kind of debugging and access some information inside a container. This is like really helpful, especially uh, during the development phase or debugging in production. You want to get some info of uh, what are the status, what are things uh, happening uh, inside that container. If I go back to the overview of uh, my production environment, Uh, so that was the front end, and let's take a look at uh, some other components that we have. Uh, in this uh, uh, application, we have the cart service, uh, which is the microservice running based on uh, JBoss EAP. If I go to the logs, uh, I see that uh, it is using this container is using the JBoss EAP 7 application server container image, a certified image that comes from Red Hat, patched and uh, secured to make sure that nothing, uh, no vulnerabilities are in it. Uh, and uh, uh, the service is deployed on that container. Uh, we have the other service as well, the catalog service that is running on a Tomcat instance. Go to the logs. Uh, oh, I want the cart again. Click wrong. Catalog here. You see that Tomcat is uh, the, the, the this this, uh, this service, the catalog service, the REST service that is deployed on top of uh, Tomcat. So as you can see, like the the the, the middleware or the uh, programming language or uh, the type of runtime that is used for the application it doesn't really matter from a deployment perspective. It's a, a complete polyglot environment. You deploy uh, whatever type of uh, application you have built uh, with whatever type of framework that you have uh, you have built. Uh, let's drill a little uh, down into Cool Store Gateway. So the Gateway, remember that was the API aggregator based on Spring Boot and Apache Camel, and these two are actually part of JBoss Fuse integration services. A middle of a product from Red Hat uh, that comes with a supported Spring Boot and supported Apache Camel for doing lightweight integration. Uh, let's drill down into that container, look at the logs. We see the uh, like uh, popular Spring Boot logo uh, in the logs, so it is running based on that. And uh, I said I mentioned this is like agile integration, and we are we are having those aggregation of the APIs in this uh, container, but we don't see much of that right here. Let's take a look into the details of those integration flows running inside that container. I can click on Open Java Console on the uh, Spring Boot Camel uh, container, the uh, Cool Store Gateway API, and that would take us to Hotio Console, which is specifically for JBoss uh, Fuse integration services to be able to take a look into what integrations are available inside in that container, what is implemented, what is their status, and how they're going. Uh, now we're inside the Fuse Integration Service Console. We see a list of all the camel routes that are um, implemented. And a camel route is basically a composition of different type of uh, microservices or calls to different uh, APIs. Uh, if you look at uh, how we can compose microservices using JBoss Fuse, so uh, we can define a series of steps using Apache Camel 
that each of those steps could be uh, using one of the enterprise integration patterns. What are those ones? For example, call these four microservices and wait for the response, and then split the message that comes into smaller pieces, transform them, and merge them together. So there is a known list of enterprise integration patterns based on uh, the, the, the enterprise um, uh, integration patterns book. Uh, that uh, Apache Camel defines based on its own DSL, and it makes it really easy to define this complex integration with a few lines of XML or uh, Java code. If I go to one of these uh, uh, Camel routes, for example, the product route that is aggregating the product information from the inventory service, I can get uh, some uh, information and stats about uh, uh, about this integration flow. For example, what's the endpoint? If, if some integration flow want to contact send a message to this one, how many exchanges has happened, and uh, what is the processing time, max and mean, and uh, average, and so on. Uh, looking at it this way is a little difficult. I think the an easier way would be to visualize it as a as a standard integration flow uh, diagram. So you see the standard notation of uh, inter enterprise integration patterns and also shows me how many exchanges have happened so far uh, through that flow. So I can look exactly how this integration is done. Uh, a message comes in, then we make a choice based on uh, what type of request it is. We transform the message, we change the body of that message and send it to the inventory service. Uh, in the backend, which is the, the inventory microservice that you're calling to get the data back and transform and provide it to uh, the, the front end. I can also take a look at the source code for that integration flow. Uh, as you can see, it's about 30 lines of XML that I have uh, implemented for exposing the REST API, uh, getting the request from the front end, transforming the message, making the call to the backend system, and transform backend sender its response to, to the front end. So that whole flow that is generally really complex to implement in code uh, is, is summarized in a very compact, concise implementation uh, through XML uh, using uh, Camel and JBoss Fuse integration services. Uh, what we used to do uh, before for integration used to be using the SOA suite and central integration uh, through a very dedicated team with really long delivery times for implementing integration through the the uh, uh, the IDEs that are specific to this integration, all of those things are, are gone and not usable when you're building a microservice application and you have integration needs. So Camel uh, running in a Spring Boot, running in a container, it allows us to take advantage of that microservices type of architecture, but at the same time be able to use enterprise integration patterns uh, to build these uh, integration flows into our um, uh, application and simplifies uh, integrate simplify integrating services together. Let's go to OpenShift uh, console again, uh, back to our containers. All right, so we have all our containers deployed. Uh, uh, and uh, it is running as a microservice, but uh, as I mentioned before, this is an online shop, and uh, in online shops, it is extremely important to provide a really good experience for the users, otherwise they will switch to some other online shop. Like, the easiest thing for a user to do is to Google for the same product, find the next shop or an Amazon or somewhere, and make the order. So conversion is always a very difficult matter on online shop. Uh, because of that, we have to be extremely careful about failures on the online shops, on the e-commerce websites. If, because failures happen anyway, right? but we have to just make sure that we have uh, built an architecture in, uh, for our application, and also infrastructure that, takes con that considers failures happening, different type of failures happening, and make sure to isolate those, uh, the scope of those failures to the services that are affected and do not propagate that to and the rest of the application. And these failures happen at several levels, uh, and uh, we need to think about all those layers, both from the infrastructure perspective and also in the application side and have uh, solutions for that to make sure to, to minimize the effect of those kind of failures. Uh, running as containers in OpenShift solve, uh, provides uh, some level of uh, that, uh, that resilience and uh, fail, fault tolerance, for example, we can, in OpenShift, easily scale up our containers to have more instances of that service running uh, so that if one of them crashes, you have other instances providing that service to, the, to your front end, to your users. Uh, we have the inventory service uh, in this container is running, and uh, right now it's running as one container. I can click on the arrow up 
and scale that to two containers. And uh, OpenShift makes sure that uh, after that container is up, it is automatically also added to the load balancer so that when we refresh the service, uh, requests go in a round robin fashion to each of those uh, containers. Like if I click more, then it will create more instances of that container. The same way I can uh, scale the service down. So I have two containers running, and if one of them crash, we have the other one that can provide the service. Uh, we can actually automate this process through what we call auto scaler uh, in terms of OpenShift. So you would define uh, a certain metric, let's say the network traffic or uh, the CPU metric. If the CPU goes beyond uh, a certain threshold, 80%, let's say, uh, you, uh, you want OpenShift to automatically scale this inventory service uh, to a maximum of five container. And if the threshold of CPU drops below what you have defined, then it would uh, scale this back to whatever the initial number that you had defined in our case was. So we can automate this scaling up and down based on a load on the application and uh, simplify even management of scale. So this is the first thing we could do to scale our application up, have several instances in case a fault, fault happens. But we don't stop really there with OpenShift around managing uh, uh, the health of this container. So if I click on, on the service, I see that we have two pods with two containers back in this service. One of them deployed an hour ago, another about a minute ago. This is the new one. And uh, if I click on that container that was deployed older, I want to go manually delete that as if that the, the, the crash had happened in that container and it was stopped for some reason. Uh, I delete the container in our production environment. And if I go back to our overview, of the product production environment, you see that OpenShift has immediately sensed that something has happened. We had defined uh, a number of containers for the inventory service to be two. We removed one of them. Uh, OpenShift has a health check mechanism that by default checks the, if the container is, is up and running. You can also override that based on your application so that the health check makes sense for the logic of your application. As soon as it sees that the container is not healthy or it doesn't exist, it spins up new containers to bring it up to the same number of instances that we had defined for it. So we had defined to have two containers. I removed one of them. Uh, it immediately discovered that one container is missing and is scaling it up to two containers. It chose uh, three uh, temporarily because one of them is being deleted and another one is being started. And uh, after uh, the operation finishes, uh, we would have two, still two containers uh, running at the same time. So that's uh, the second level of uh, uh, resilience that we can provide uh, around the containers to make sure that uh, whenever we define how many how many these containers this, uh, uh, this service should scale to, uh, OpenShift makes sure that those number of containers are running at all time, even though a crash happens or something happens in, in the application. Uh, but that's not really uh, the, the application level tolerance. So this is the container level tolerance, that uh, fault tolerance that OpenShift is taking care of. But we still have to make sure that from application perspective, we also uh, take into consideration what happens if one of the services that we are dependent on uh, fails. Uh, for example, uh, usually in, in the world of microservices, we have services calling each other. So a client uh, calls the first service, that service is relying on three other services, and those services in turn might call other, other backend market services. If one of these services is slow, usually this directly affects the calling service uh, performance. So the first service has to wait for the second service till the response comes back, and if every time it takes 15 seconds, it means that my client, in this case the front end, it would have to wait, the user has to wait 15 seconds till it gets the response. So one service being slow, that makes the entire application being slow. Even worse than that, you might have a service failing. And when that service failed, that would cause the next service calling it fail. And that would cause the next service fail till all that, that, all that is propagated to the user. So we would call, you would experience uh, cascading failures in your application. And these are just a few of the scenarios uh, that you would experience and you would need to think about in order to build service resilience into the architecture of the application. Uh, in JBoss Fuse services and Apache Camel, there is built-in support for integrating uh, uh, your integration flows into uh, some of the components of Netflix OSS, like Hysterix for a circuit breaker pattern and uh, um, Turbine uh, server for uh, uh, collecting and aggregating this data. So what does Hysterix do? 
uh, in this example, if uh, the, the one of these uh, uh, dependent services are failing, uh, if we're using Hystrix in the scenario, Hystrix would make sure that in the next call, we don't call the service again. For a number of for a seconds or a number of minutes, whatever is defined, we'll blacklist this service and we'd not call that. If the first service is calling us, we would immediately return a fixed response that is previously defined or fall back to another service, whatever uh, that integration developer has implemented uh, through Camel. So this way, we give some time to the failing service to come up, back up, or get, get debugged. Um, if after a while, after uh, that blacklist period finishes, we're going to give that service a try again. Uh, if that service works, then uh, we remove it from the blacklist and start calling it again. This, this scenario is called a circuit breaker that uh, when this server ser service fails, we're going to open the circuit at this moment, at this uh, stage, so that calls cannot get propagated to, uh, uh, to, the, to the failing service. Um, Hystrix uh, also provides a dashboard that can visualize uh, all this. I'm going to click on that to uh, take a look at the circuits that we have in our uh, cool store gateway. You see we have uh, one circuit per each of the REST APIs that we are calling on the backend services. There is the one for the card service deleting items, one for uh, getting item, the product, inventory, and, uh, and so on. If I refresh the page a couple of times, So that we get uh, more calls on these REST APIs. Uh, we see that number of successful calls has gone up uh, on these APIs and all the circuits are closed, means that everything is healthy, all the calls are uh, normally going to the backend services and uh, is as expected. But let's go and take down some of these services as if there, there was a proper crash in our containers and we cannot recover from that. So right now we have two containers backing our inventory service. I'm going to scale that down to zero uh, so that our in entire inventory service uh, is gone. We cannot show uh, stocks, uh, stock status for any of the products. So if we hadn't thought of service resilience into our service, that usually causes uh, a, a failure in that application. So when the web page is refreshed, uh, we, we have a call for uh, getting the inventory status for each of these products. And since that service failed, there was an exception for the entire website and the whole cool store web shop comes down. And that's, that's pretty much the worst thing we can do for our conversion because as a as an e-commerce shopper, once you go to a shop and you get a Java exception or the whole site is down, you can guarantee that the user never comes back uh, to that uh, e-shop. It's the best way to lose customer. And that's, of course, we don't want that to happen. So what we could do is that we could isolate using the circuit breaker, isolate that failure to only the inventory status. So we could, uh, if I refresh this page, uh, the way we implemented the, uh, the service resilience using Hystrix and uh, Camel uh, in the cool store gateway is that if the inventory service is down, just show a fixed uh, uh, text a static content instead. So we can't uh, show what's the inventory status for the service, but we do not stop our users from making orders. So we can allow them to still browse the website, make orders shop, and we take this tiny risk that maybe they order something that is out of stock. And uh, if that happens, there's always a chance that we could uh, backorder the, uh, those products from our uh, suppliers and send it to our customers a little later, or just apologize for it and offer some other product. So that would just possibly piss off a significantly smaller portion of our customer rather than bringing the whole website down and uh, lose a significant amount of revenue uh, because of that. Uh, let's refresh this page a couple of times while the inventory service is down and see uh, how the circuit breaker uh, is uh, kicking in. So as you see, we, we don't get any delays because the inventory service is down. Uh, since Hystrix knows already that that service is down, is failing, it doesn't even make the call to that service anymore. It directly retains a response. So we have still a very responsive uh, web shop despite one of our services down and we partially have shut down some of this functionality. If I go to Hystrix uh, monitor, we see that uh, the circuit for the inventory service is open, which means that we're not making any calls to that backend anymore. Everything else is functioning, all the circuits closed, except uh, the inventory service. So when the service in the page is refreshed, we skip calling the inventory service and just show the static content. Let's uh, scale the service back up.
takes a second till our inventory services comes up. As soon as this comes up, we can go uh, and uh, uh, check our web shop to see uh, if Hysterix has notified that the service is up and it can again show uh, the inventory status for our refresh the page a couple of times. Okay, back up. Now we see the inventory information is uh, displayed again. And uh, Historix has removed the inventory service from the blacklist and closed the circuit. So since the call has been successful, now it starts passing all the calls to the backend service. So uh, using Historix, uh, Netflix Historix, and uh, uh, integrating that into Camel with a string boot as a part of JBoss Fuse integration service, uh, we can bring more resilience into inside our application as well by not breaking the whole application down when faults happen and try to isolate that as much as possible to only those services that are uh, failing. Um, all right, so that's an overview of the application that we are working with. Uh, but uh, what we want to do in the rest of this demo is that uh, we have uh, been, uh, uh, we had, there has been an issue with this polo shirt, uh, polo shirt that you see uh, on our cool store. And there has been some problem with the color used to produce this. So the manufacturer has asked us to recall this product from our uh, uh, cool store or online store. And the way recalling products works in e-commerce e is that you usually get a deadline for taking that product back, taking that product down. And if you don't take it down on that uh, till that date, you have to pay financial damage for every day that is that product is on because that damages the manufacturer, the supplier's reputation. Uh, so we need to take this down as soon as possible, but that inventory list uh, come the, the status of inventory and the list of the product that comes from uh, an ERP system in the uh, uh, in the backend uh, that is about 20 years old. And we have made a request to remove the product from, uh, from the catalog, but they have given us two weeks to do that. Um, and that's one week later than the deadline that we have got. So we have decided as a, as a workaround in the meantime, to modify our inventory service for this product and set the inventory to zero. So we intercept the calls basically to this backend system, return a zero inventory and prevent our users from uh, uh, buying this product and uh, skip all the financial damage. So I'm the developer that uh, this Jira issue is assigned to me uh, to make that change and push that to production right away. Uh, without causing any downtime. So uh, we, this is happening during the day and I don't want to cause any disruption in the production traffic. Code is uh, hosted on uh, uh, Gox, which is a Git service uh, similar to uh, GitHub. Uh, and this whole uh, Gox server is actually running uh, inside OpenShift as a container with a Postgres backend as well. I'm going to log in with my uh, developer account. If I go to Explore, we see there is a team repository called, called uh, CoolStore Backer Service, which is the, all the code for uh, all the services running in this application. Uh, but the way that we work uh, in this project is that uh, developers don't have direct access for committing code into the team repository. We have uh, more senior developers that have commit access and they can review the code. Uh, that is written by other developers and uh, if it's good if it's all right then we can then they merge it into that team repository uh, this is the process that they use to to maintain code quality uh, for our application so uh, this this process uh, became popular on uh, on uh, github and it's a lot of teams including ours is using that so they have a team repository and me as a developer i fork that team repository to get a copy of that in my own personal space I can clone that, make uh, code changes, uh, test that, and I'm happy with the changes. I commit it back to my Git repo, uh, to my fork repo, and after I'm ready, uh, I can send a pull request to the team repository so that a senior developer or code reviewer can take a look at that pull request. We can discuss different issues, maybe modify some of the parts to make sure that it complies with our code convention, with the best practices, and uh, after, uh, we get approval from a number of uh, uh, code reviewers, then we can merge that that code reviewer can merge that change into the team Git repository. So we'll, we'll use that process to uh, in, in this demo as well. So what I need to do is that I don't have access to commit anything to this Git repo. I need to fork this one to my own personal account. 
to my developer account. Okay, fork. Uh, now we see that I have a copy of the Coolstone microservice repository under my own account, and it also says that it's forked from team at Coolstore microservice. Let's copy uh, the URL to this Git repo and go to my IDE and clone the code and make some uh, changes. Go to the uh, Git uh, view. This is JBoss Developer Studio. Uh, which is uh, essentially Eclipse with the JBoss tools, plugins, and some other plugins installed on it. I'm going to clone the Git repo. By default, it reads it from clipboard, so the default URL is correct there. I'm going to enter my credentials and clone the Git repo. I don't need all the branches. I just want to work on the master branch. And the default location is fine. Clone it there. It's a big repo, so it takes a few seconds till it takes down uh, all the bits. You could also use any other ID in this sense. So if you're used to IntelliJ or um, other tools, uh, it doesn't really make any difference. You just clone the code and uh, start working with it. Uh, so I have cloned the Coolstone microservice, the, uh, the fork repo that I have in my own uh, workspace. Uh, and I want to modify the inventory service. So the first thing I'm going to do is to import that as a Maven project. That was a Java project running on JBoss EAP based on Maven. Switch to the Java view. I have my inventory service open. It is a standard Java project with a number of uh, REST services. Uh, since we uh, do test-driven uh, development uh, in our team, uh, I'm going to start by writing a test that verifies that uh, the inventory status for those recall products uh, uh, is zero. And afterwards, I'm going to write the code uh, that uh, makes sure that unit test passes. We have an inventory test service uh, that was prepared before that does exactly this check. It uh, takes a list of the recall products and then tests if, uh, uh, if uh, the inventory status for those products are zero. And right now, this is ignored from our test suite. I'm going to remove the ignore annotation so that this is included and runs uh, in our, uh, uh, as a part of our unit test. I can run that unit test immediately inside the ID as well. I say run. I see that it fails uh, expectedly because we haven't really made any code change yet. I just enable the test that uh, tests those products are actually recalled. And the message, of course, is that the product uh, we expected to have zero inventory, but there are 10 of them. Uh, let's go to inventory uh, service and uh, uh, remove the stock, like basically removes return zero for the stock assets of those specific products. We have some commented code here that actually does that for us. So we are circumventing those data that we get from the ERP system. Uh, and if it's those products that are uh, recall, we set the quantity to zero in the inventory and return the result to the front end. After the ERP system is updated, and we can remove this code and uh, let the data pass through from the backend system. Uh, okay, let's uh, run this unit test once more. This is green, so uh, the code seems to be working. Let's commit that and uh, uh, push that to our Git repository. I have to add the, these files that I've changed to the list of uh, changes that I want to commit. Move the recall product from stock. And I comment and push them to my fork repo. OK. Take a look at a repository, refresh the page. You see that the last commit is the one that we just made, and those uh, code changes are made. So now that I have uh, made the code changes, I have to make a pull request to send these changes for a review to the team repository. I can do that by uh, clicking the green button to create a pull request, I give it a, a title. Products, uh, call products removed from inventory. I can also see the bottom, the list of commits included in this pull request and what files have been changed. Create a pull request. 
okay, my job as a developer is done. Uh, I will log out and log in as a code reviewer back into uh, GOG's uh, uh, Git server. I see some logs here. I see that uh, the developer has sent a pull request uh, to this repo. Could go to the repo and take a closer look. Uh, as you can see, that commit doesn't exist in, uh, in the team repo yet, but we have one pull request uh, waiting here for to be reviewed. And that's the one that was sent a few seconds ago by the developer. Uh, click on it. I see the name of it, some description. I can see the list of commits that have happened, a uh, list of files that have been changed uh, in this as a part of this pull request. And then generally there is a convention in every team that how many people have to re review and approve the change to go uh, to be able to merge into the team repository. In our team, one reviewer is enough. Uh, I create a plus uh, one and add a comment uh, to show my approval for this change. And since one approve is enough, uh, we can merge this pull request uh, into, uh, into our Git repo, that team Git repo. If I go to the list of comments now, I can see that now uh, that git commit is available in the uh, in the list of commits um, in our git repo. All right, now that they have, have uh, made the changes into um, uh, our team repo, we want to push this into our uh, uh, production environment. We generally do that through a continuous delivery a pipeline. So in OpenShift, uh, there's a support for building uh, uh, pipelines to automate the delivery of the application and push it through different stages of development and push, and they push it into production. Uh, right now, uh, in the list of services that are built for that cool, cool store application is built of, we are working on an inventory service. So part of our pipeline going to focus on testing the inventory service uh, in an isolated environment, and part of the pipeline would test that with the rest of the services. Uh, uh, this is the layout of the pipeline, how it uh, looks like. Uh, we have uh, every change that happens in the team Git repository, uh, like the, the merge that we did right now uh, for the pull request. Uh, first, the inventory test environment uh, is used to build a jar file, build a Docker image for that uh, uh, application with the changes for the inventory service, deploy it on its server, and run a couple of tests. If all of that is successful, then we promote that Docker image to the cool store test environment. And there we test the entire cool store application with all the services together. Uh, so it's, it's a kind of a system test environment or user acceptance testing environment. And after that is successful, we will promote the image into our inventory image into production environment and make a production uh, uh, deployment. But at that stage, uh, we do not replace the live inventory service, but we deploy it into the new container running side by side the, the live inventory service without touching the production traffic. And at that point, we wait for a approval from a, a release manager or someone that is authorized to approve uh, switching traffic or going live in production. This step is usually integrated into your IT workflow management. If you use ServiceNow or Jiva workflow or something else, or even uh, like chat ops uh, in Slack or Rocket Chat, uh, this step is generally integrated into those systems that you could get a notification in that system or a task that uh, deployment is ready in production and they're waiting for go live approval. You click somewhere and traffic is changed uh, to set the new service live in production. Uh, let's go take a look at uh, our project. We have a number of projects in OpenShift for different environments. We have the inventory test environment that is testing the inventory service in uh, isolation. We have only the inventory deployed and uh, its database. And then we have the test environment that uh, the entire uh, cool store application is deployed, but uh, we don't touch any other services as this, as this pipeline except the inventory. So we only update the inventory container in the test environment and, and test all the services together. And uh, then we have the production environment, which is the production for uh, the application running live. Uh, that's the one that we have been looking at uh, at the moment. And there's a CI CD project also that we have all the infrastructure for our CI CD. You see the GOG server running with its uh, Postgres backend uh, with some persistent storage attached to the Postgres so that the data doesn't disappear when the container dies or moves around. Uh, we have Jenkins running that is running our pipeline and Nexus as our Maven repository uh, manager. 
if I go to the build uh, and pipelines, I see the OpenShift uh, pipeline uh, running in the CI/CD project, and it's already finished building the container for the new uh, inventory service with the change included. It has run the test, uh, has been successful. It promoted into the test environment to run all the services together and test them. And even since that has been also successful, they have promoted it into production and deployed into a, a container that is not live. So we deployed into a new container in production. Uh, we do not replace the old one and start running smoke tests and some maybe even manual tests against uh, this new container. And at that point, uh, we wait for a manual approval uh, for the go live. Uh, so what we are, what this process is called, is a blue green deployment. Uh, in in order to be able to deploy in production without causing any downtime. So right now, at the deploy production uh, with no traffic step, we deployed into a new container, the green container, and the production traffic is still going to the blue container. And after approval happens, we switch the traffic to the new container and still keep the blue container up and running so that we can test the new container still with the complete production data, production uh, traffic. If something happens, we can uh, roll back to the previous version by just switching our router to the previous version. So this, this allows us to, without disrupting traffic in production, easily go back and forth uh, between different versions of our application that are running in parallel uh, in production. Uh, so pipeline has continued. Smoke test has succeeded in uh, in the production, the the new container, and uh, we are waiting for an input, uh, an approval to go live with these changes. Let's go take a look in our production environment, see how that looks like. If I click on the inventory live service, we see that there are actually two containers providing the inventory. One is called inventory uh, green that was deployed about an hour ago. And we have inventory blue that was deployed three minutes ago. This is the new container that we just set up with the changes. But as you can see in the traffic split, 100% of the traffic is going to the older container, which doesn't contain our change, and 0% is going to the new container. So we can test this container, the new change in production, uh, with the production data, but without really affecting any of the users because we're sending all the traffic to the uh, to the previous version. We could even do other patterns of deployment. For example, we could do canary release by instead of putting 0% on the new container, we could put like 5% of traffic in a new container and see how the new service uh, reacts to, uh, to, the, to the production traffic, to the portion of traffic that is going to this new service and progressively increase that traffic to 100% when we are confident that a new service can, uh, can function as expected. Uh, what we are doing in this demo is a blue green deployment so we don't uh, uh, send any traffic to the new uh, container before we are sure that everything is functioning and just switch uh, router switch the traffic completely to the new container let's take a look at our cold store uh, we wanted to take down this polo shirt uh, out of stock we see that that change hasn't happened yet right because the inventory service that is live right now does not contain any of the uh, changes we have made in the code. Let's go back to our pipeline. And uh, I click on input required. So this pipeline is using Jenkins uh, DSL for uh, describing uh, 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 continuous delivery pipeline. It's a very powerful syntax and very popular for uh, building pipelines. Uh, in this demo, I haven't integrated this into ServiceNow or any other workflow system, so we're going to directly go into a Jenkins running on OpenShift and approve the launch after approve the go live uh, directly in Jenkins. Since Jenkins is running on OpenShift, the authentication is also integrated with OpenShift, so I can log in with my OpenShift uh, credentials into Jenkins, and since I'm authorized to approve uh, this go live, I uh, click on go live. And that would switch the traffic to um, the new uh, deployment. Okay, the pipeline is executed successfully. Let's go to back to the production environment and take a look to see how uh, the containers uh, look like. So as you see now, it's switched. We see 100% of the traffic is on the blue container. The inventory blue container that was deployed five minutes ago through the pipeline and zero was going to the previous version the green container which was deployed an hour ago 
So now if I go to the cool store uh, web page, any call to the inventory service would come from the new version of the container. If you see something is not functioning properly, then it can always switch back from the blue container to the green container and uh, have the previous version function in a matter of a second. So it wouldn't cause any disruption of traffic in the production and I can quickly atomically switch traffic between the previous version or new version, do uh, forward, uh, like rollback and uh, rolling forward uh, quite easily directly in the production environment. Let's refresh the page um, and see if the product is taken in off the website. As you can see, the inventory is, says unavailable. So we still have inventory for all the other products, but uh, now we have uh, intercepted a call to that ERP system and, and setting the inventory to zero for this Polo product uh, and uh, save all the financial damage that uh, should have been caused by the the old ERP system in the back end. Um, all right, so this is how we could uh, make a change and uh, quickly push that into uh, production uh, as a developer or as a, someone that is authorized to, to do deployment in production without causing any, any downtime that we could do this uh, directly in the production uh, during the daytime. No maintenance window is required to be on the weekend. Uh, but as a developer, I'm also interested to make sure that my application is secure. I hear a lot about these high-profile uh, CVEs that break out on internet, like uh, the uh, Heartbleed or Poodle or Shellshock and things like that. And uh, I'm, I'm a developer. I just write code, so I don't know too much about how to make this container secure. But I don't want my container to have these issues. And uh, uh, OpenShift provides a way for you to be able to do that also easily. Because of that. Uh, OpenShift provides a management suite called CloudForms as a part of its offering that gives you a little more insight into the containers running. With the CloudForms management engine, you can uh, manage OpenShift and containers and also other type of infrastructure. If you're running on Amazon or VMware or Red Hat Virtualization or something else, uh, it, it, it's a single pane of glass for managing any type of infrastructure. What I want to show infrastructure, what I want to show you right now, what it can do for the container. And it is looking at my uh, OpenShift environment, and it gives me some stats, how much CPU I have left as a pool of resources in my uh, OpenShift environment, how much memory. You see that memory-wise, it's a little uh, orange, so I have 80% use and not so much uh, left. I got to add more nodes to my OpenShift environment. And also a list of uh, uh, all the resources that I use, how many projects are there, how many images, uh, and so on. If I click on a project, I see the list of projects and how many resources are each each of in each of these projects, how many pods, containers. And right now, I'm logged in as an admin. I can see everything. Uh, we could remove some of the access so that a, a person is only uh, can access uh, uh, his own uh, projects or his own containers, uh, not to be able to look at anything else. Um, go back to the overview. So what we wanted to look at is to make sure that the containers that I've deployed, they are secure and they do not contain any CV issues. I would go to the list of images that are available in my OpenShift environment. And uh, we see the inventory service that we created, that we deployed, is uh, up on the list. I, I can click on it. And it gives me some really valuable information about this image deployed. First of all, it, it tells me in which projects, pods, containers, and nodes this particular image is deployed. Uh, this is also uh, really uh, helpful because sometimes you have one image deployed in several containers. And by coming into CloudForm, it would immediately tell me, OK, this is specific image is deployed on those five projects. So I, can, I, have, I have an overview of which teams are using the image that I have made available uh, in the inventory. And uh, if you come a little more down, we see something interesting. We see that the compliant as seven minutes ago. So about seven minutes ago, a compliant check, a compliance check has been done on this image, and we are compliant. But what does it mean? Uh, what, what is that compliance that is checked? Uh, on the right side, you see what compliance we have configured in CloudForm at the moment. We are using OpenSCAP, which is a standard way for checking CVEs and vulnerabilities against the uh, uh, Linux environment, Linux system. And since these are Linux containers, the same rules apply to Linux containers as well. We see that 421 rules have been checked. And uh, right now, we are compliant and uh, we are not causing any high profile issue. I can also download that uh, report of the 
uh, vulnerability scanning as a really nicely formatted HTML to, to send it to people and uh, share it in the organization if it's uh, needed. Uh, let's download and open it, uh, take a look at it. Uh, it gives me what uh, the name of the benchmark and uh, uh, the list of the rules that have been uh, used to verify uh, this image. Uh, how many rules have been passed and how many have been failed? We have 420 rules that uh, are green and one medium uh, severity that has failed. So by default, in, cloud, in my CloudForm environment, I have defined that only prevent containers from being deployed if there is a high severity uh, issue vulnerability existing in the containers. So since this is a medium one, so we don't block it from deploying, we allow uh, being deployed. I can get a list of all the rules that I've checked uh, with their severity. If I click on one, I see which CVEs are related to each of those uh, uh, rules and how the result of that check has been to get more information. So uh, we made sure that this container is, is secure. It doesn't contain any uh, uh, vulnerability. And uh, we can always share this report uh, within the organization to make sure everybody is aware of which, con which containers are, are compliant uh, within our application. And if something is not compliant, we can prevent it from uh, being deployed in the application in the, on, on OpenShift platform. Uh, so I, I took a little more than uh, uh, was expected. It didn't leave so much time for QA. Uh, I think I'm going to stop uh, at this point and allow uh, <laughs> if there is any uh, burning question I could answer. Wow. My, well, my mind is blown. This has got to be the, the, the best uh, demo I've seen in ages in terms of covering off pretty much every aspect of, um, of the full stack. Um, there was one question about the Hystrix um, container, um, whether and maybe this will a good way to, to bring some closure here. He was uh, looking for the container in GitHub. He found the cool store, but he could not find um, the Hystrix container. Um, can you pop over to where the code is for all this demoing you've been doing? Uh, absolutely. So I have one slide put it here that this is, you can absolutely try this at home and please do try it at home. Uh, you could go to uh, uh, this uh, uh, GitHub repository on the JBoss Demo Central and Cool Store Microservices. Uh, let me show you. Uh, just be careful that we have, or be aware that we have a couple of branches if you're running on uh, different versions of uh, OpenShift. For 3.4, you can go to the stable branch to make sure that it uh, doesn't break in the middle of uh, your things because it's a very active repository. We keep uh, working on it. And you get a lot of information about how to deploy the thing. So the application code is here, but Hystrix, uh, we are using the images that are available on Docker Hub and under OpenShift. There are a bunch of templates that uh, we use to deploy that. So there is a template for Netflix OSS list that takes those containers from Docker Hub registry and deploy them on uh, OpenShift. Uh, uh, on the same repo, there is also some guide if you want to deploy that whole demo. Uh, there is a provisioning script that helps you to run that and sets up the whole thing uh, in whatever OpenShift environment that you have. Well, well you really covered pretty much every base. Uh... Uh, there were a couple of questions, and then you hit them too while you're talking. So um, I'm, I'm, mind is blown. Uh, see, I'm, I think you really touched on a lot of things. I hadn't seen the history stuff before. Um, I love that you closed on the open scap stuff. Um, that's uh, one of my favorite things to remind people to do. And this has been pretty awesome. I, I also think that there are a number of pieces and parts of this that could be full-on demos themselves. So um, I look forward to doing some deeper dives and drill downs on, on different parts of this as well. But um, for, for those of you who are listening or who are watching this later, please do um, reach out to us. And if you have questions, um, send them to um, either the mailing list at OpenShift Commons or to, directly to Simiak. Um, you want to throw back up your uh, contact information there again on the screen so we end with, with that Absolutely. slide. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll uh, skip. If they have issues with the demo, should they just um, log an issue in um, in GitHub on it? Uh, in any any of those works, absolutely. So the first choice is that just create an issue on GitHub or drop me an email. Uh, either of that uh, would work. I can, uh, if you have problems setting it up or refine box, definitely contact me. And uh, are you um, by any chance planning on coming to KubeCon in Berlin in a couple of weeks and um, to the OpenShift Commons gathering? I know you're in Stockholm, so you're on the right continent at least. 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, looking forward to it, actually. Counting weeks till is that date, and I'm going to hang out in the OpenShift booth there. Uh, so definitely come by. If any of you guys uh, are there, come talk to me, give me feedback, and uh, we can have a chat about any of the pieces we uh, presented today. Perfect. So um, I'll definitely get some FaceTime in um, with you, and everybody else can too at the gathering, at um, the OpenShift gathering on March 28th and the 29th and 30th. You'll be captive probably in the booth at OpenShift, uh, the OpenShift Red Hat booth. So thanks again, Sumyat, for doing this. And um, we look forward to everybody's feedback and seeing some versions of the cool store up there in the universe um, tweaked out for your cool stuff. So thanks again. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Diane. Bye. Bye.